need both of you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, so as Peter was saying, uh, I'm going to talk about what we're doing with Spark and discuss uh, one of our use cases. Um, so I'm going to talk about why we're using Spark for our use case. I'm going to talk about what the architecture around it. And beyond that, I would just like to talk about what some findings that we had with what we wanted to do. Uh, so what's the problem that we're trying to solve? So as Peter was saying, we get a, data, a lot of data from hundreds of thousands of publishers and across hundreds of millions of uh, websites. Um, and we have to process the data to produce roll-ups for them. So I don't know if you can really see. But the point is that we produce data points like reach numbers, uh, page views, and the demographic composition across a lot of uh, different data points. And it becomes a combinatorial explosion uh, for which we have to do huge amounts of batch computation. So as you can imagine, that if you are slicing, your uh, slicing and dicing your data in multiple ways and you're combining it, suddenly you have to calculate data points. Like The number of data points that you have to calculate just keeps growing. So this is becoming a problem in our batch computation system because we're uh, pre-computing these numbers. And what's worse is that um, most of these data points will never even be looked at. So if somebody is going to a website and looking at it, which certainly not everything will be looked at in a given day. Uh, it's also not very flexible because the data that you get is whatever has been pre-computed. Uh, which means I cannot do arbitrary filtering, like finding out what is the female 18 to 25-year-old audience in New York interested, the people who come to my website, what they're interested in. And maybe you want to filter further. But it's not possible because the pre-computed results are just whatever we think that people would want to look at. But that may not be true. So to solve this, we came up with an architecture where we don't pre-compute um, these results. Instead, we have uh, semi-aggregated data that we keep in NoSQL stores. And then we use Spark to distribute queries on top of it and uh, do in-memory filtering. Um, we also realized, as we were building our prototypes, that not we could not our use case did not fit one particular NoSQL store. So some NoSQL stores are good for certain things, like doing rain scans. Some of them are good at doing point queries. And our use case just did not fit one of them. Uh, plus, most of the NoSQL stores generally don't even support a join operation, which is why we started looking at Spark in the first place, that if we could do join operations with Spark, we wouldn't need that much capability from the NoSQL store. Um, so like I said, we, join, we use multiple NoSQL stores, and we join data across them. And uh, on top of the NoSQL stores, we have a query API, which can be used by the website. Uh, and it has flexible filtering capability. So if a user is drilling down, if they want to get hold of their female 18 to 25 audience, those filters can pass down to our query API, and we can calculate uh, those data points. So the architecture is something like this. Um, we're using HBase and uh, Aerospike for different uh, data sets. Uh, we batch load the data on a daily basis. Um, and the data, ba uh, data is sharded 256 ways in a manner that the user query can perform uh, parallel independent joins. Uh, a user query comes in through the query API um, and is executed as a short Spark program. So we, our programs usually run at kind of web speed. So you can think something like one second to 10 seconds. Um, which, as I'll talk about later, uh, made us realize some problems with Spark. Um, so the user query comes into the query API. It is uh, divided 
among the Spark executors, and uh, each executor picks up a shard from Edgebase and from Aerospike and joins the data. And uh, we do linear scans on Edgebase, and then we do hundreds of thousands of random lookups on Aerospike for each user query. And finally, a reduce by key operation combines the results and returns the results to the user. Um, so in this architecture, we have the Spark executors are long lived, so they're servicing multiple queries. I mean, they, they stay alive all the time and they're serving, servicing uh, multiple queries. Uh, this is because we cannot afford to bring up uh, executors every time a new query comes in because we're trying to really make the latency be low. Uh, separate from this is our uh, cluster scheduler, which is used to allocate Spark executors on our cluster. And that helps us uh, in having a fault tolerant architecture where if we lose executors, the Spark driver will realize that uh, an executor is gone, and then it'll ask for a new one in its place. Um, so some of the things that we found out while building this was, well, I mean, it, the, so there's a single point of failure within Spark. So even though the executors are fault tolerant, uh, the driver itself is a single point of failure. So if you lose your driver, all the context of everything that you've accumulated in memory is also gone and the executors go away, uh, which makes Spark somewhat less ideal to run long running services. It's fine for running jobs, but if you're trying to build a website off of it and it's a long running service, that doesn't quite work. And especially if you're trying to build a website off of it, you cannot afford to have Spark executors with large amounts of in-memory state because the startup time would be too high. So initially, we were trying an architecture where we would just load the data off of, uh, off of the file system and just do everything, all of the queries in memory. And we soon realized that that was not going to work for us because that makes the worker bring up time maybe like a couple of minutes, and that really cannot work for a web service which is why we decided to go in the direction of using a NoSQL store so that um, the Spark workers are uh, stateless and you can very quickly bring up new ones if you lose the driver. In fact, one of the architecture things that we're planning to do is have standby drivers, which, uh, which will be standing by asking for executors. So if, we, if you lose your driver, uh, suddenly all the executors will be gone, but uh, the new driver will be quickly able to get new workers and continue from there. So that kind of gives us some capability of being a fault tolerant long running service. Um, the other thing that we found out with Spark is that even though it runs much faster than Hadoop, there are still problems when you're trying to run really short jobs like jobs which take up a couple of seconds. So as you see in this example, the jobs are running, uh, let's say, one to two seconds long. Uh, but the initial yellow portion, which shows the scheduling delay, is about 200 milliseconds. And that becomes a problem when you're trying to do really low latency things with Spark. Um, we found out that most of this is happening because of Java serialization. Um, so Spark has the capability of using cryo serialization, but it's only, it only works for serializing the actual data in the RDDs. It doesn't work for serializing the tasks themselves. Um, so we have submitted some patches which uh, allow you to use Spark, uh, to use cryo serialization for task scheduling as well, which helped us reduce the latency quite a bit. Also, another thing to notice is that the scheduling time, as this figure shows, is proportional to the number of partitions that you have. 
So if you think you can parallelize your work by just having more partitions, that only works to a certain level because then the scheduling time itself starts becoming important. Um, and finally, I have a list of other th things that we learned from our Spark experience. Um, so when you're trying to really speed up your Spark program such that they run in a few seconds, it's very important to experiment and fine tune the number of partitions. Uh, and this ties into the fact that you cannot parallelize as much as you would like to. So it's important to make the number of partitions be what you are willing to handle, the amount of latency that you are willing to take. So it's really a lot of experimenting with the number of partitions. Um, another thing that I observed was that the way you write your Spark program really influences, in, influences the number of shuffle points and the number of stages that your program is going to have. And you may think you understand how many stages your program has, but that's not always the case. So it's always good to go and look at the actual execution of the program to figure out how many stages there were, how many shuffle points there were, which can really help in speeding up your Spark programs. We also found out um, that Using map partitions um, is useful in some cases. Um, so map partitions, if you don't know, it lets you, basically it's like a big hammer kind of operation which lets you just run a certain program on each partition. So you can kind of collapse the program and do everything within map partitions, which in generally may not be a good idea. But in certain cases, it really helps in optimizing because you can avoid having needless shuffles if you can do some kind of multiple steps within map partitions. Uh, another thing which was really surprising for us was in a tight loop, we were having problems with memory utilization. And we realized that was just happening because of how for loops are implemented in Scala. And if you're using zip, with index in a for loop, that's going to create a whole lot of needless objects and cause a lot of GC pauses. Um, so a simple fix for that would be using while loops instead. And it sounds like a very small thing, but it made a huge difference for us in our programs. Um, that concludes my talk. Um, if you have uh, any questions, I'd be happy to answer. So th this is a tool which was uh, released by UC Berkeley. Um, it basically collects a trace of events. So Spark has a capability of collecting a trace of events, saying that this task was started, this is when it started serialization, this is when it went to the worker, actually started executing, this is when it sends back the results. The tool from UC Berkeley let, takes in that input and plots it out. So I found this very useful for uh, debugging the performance. Yes? I, I don't think anybody's working on that problem because nobody, as far as I know, really cares about scheduling delays given that tasks usually run much longer than a couple of seconds. Uh, but the problem is that when a job is broken up into tasks, it, it basically creates a list of tasks before it starts scheduling even the first one. So you can imagine that just creating that list of tasks. And producing that list of tasks is a pretty expensive serialization work, which is why cryo serialization helps over here. 
but essentially it creates one array of tasks and it doesn't start scheduling them until that array is created. So if it actually did create one task and schedule it, it would be much faster, but it doesn't do that yet. No, I don't think it's related to that at all because that decision has already been made. Uh, it's just, just a simple way of doing it, I guess. Yes? We are hiring, yes. So if you're interested in finding out about this project or any other projects that are happening at Concast, uh, talk to me after this. All right, that's it, thank you.